welcome. Good evening and welcome. If you could take your seats, please. Good evening. My name is Matt Abbott, and I am the Director of Government and Diplomatic Programs here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Before we begin, please note, today's event is on the record and live streamed. We always welcome your social media engagement, but please silence your phones. Please also note that the Council is an independent and nonpartisan platform. Views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of the Council. Later, we will be taking audience questions from the room or online at ccga.live. Also, following tonight's program, our Young Professionals Network will be hosting a cocktails and conversation program at Free Rain in the St. Jane Hotel. Before I turn it over to our speaker, a few brief words of introduction. Jan Hatzius is Chief Economist and Head of Global Econ uh, uh, Economics and Market Research at Goldman Sachs. Previously, he was a research officer at the London School of Economics. Hatzius is ranked the number one economist in the annual Institutional Investor All-America Fixed Income Research Team, a position he has held for the past six years and a two-time winner of the Lawrence R. Klein Award by Blue Chip Economic Indicators for the most accurate U.S. economic forecast over the prior four years, a period that includes the global financial crisis. He is also a member of the Economic Advisory Panels of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and the Congressional Budget Office. Now, please join me in welcoming Jan Hatzius to the stage. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, and wonderful to be uh, here in Chicago to talk about the economic outlook. I think I'm going to talk for something like uh, 35 or 40 minutes, and then there's going to be uh, plenty of time for uh, a discussion. Um, so title of the outlook is Tug of War. This refers to adverse policy shocks, especially on trade policy, uh, versus a resilient private sector uh, in, the, in the United States and in most uh, advanced economies around the world. Uh, and uh, we think that those two forces really are going to be shaping the outlook uh, over, the, over the next year or so in particular. Uh, and before I talk about some of the uh, details of our uh, expectations, I do want to uh, just briefly summarize what we expect uh, broadly for the U.S. and global economy. Uh, and here are the main points. Uh, number one, uh, we do still think that some further tariff increases are likely. Uh, we are building in uh, eventually uh, increases in uh, the rate on $250 billion of uh, tariffs of, uh, on uh, uh, U.S. imports from China from 25 to 30%, though probably with a delay, our expectation is that the uh, October 15th deadline is going to be pushed out. Uh, and we also expect uh, tariffs on the remaining roughly $150 billion uh, of U.S. imports from China uh, that is currently scheduled for December 15th. Again, timing may shift on this, but, uh, but we do expect that. We don't expect a comprehensive deal between the United States and China before the 2020 election, um, although uh, we are looking for uh, an end to the tariff escalation as the 2020 election uh, approaches. Uh, so we think these two steps will occur, but uh, no further escalation uh, beyond that. Uh, number two on U.S. growth, uh, currently we're growing at about a trend pace, uh, about 1.5% to 2% in the second half of this year. Our expectation is a modest acceleration as we go into 2000. Uh, and 20 to a little bit more than 2%. Uh, third point um, related to this, uh, we think that while there is a risk of recession and that risk has probably gone up as the economy has slowed, uh, our baseline is still very much no recession uh, and continued growth uh, with, uh, for, for, for a couple of reasons, mainly the absence of the sort of imbalances in the private sector that have in the past uh, led to uh, recessions uh, in the US and elsewhere. Uh, fourth main point uh, on the inflation side, inflation has generally been low uh, relative to the Federal Reserve's target, below 2%. Uh, that's been true for 
uh, most of 2019 as well. Uh, we think that a lot of that weakness probably reflects more statistical factors that are likely to unwind as we get through uh, the remainder of 2019 into 2020. Um, we've already moved up somewhat from 1.6% to 1.8%. We think we'll probably move up to 2% on an underlying basis. Uh, and then to the extent that additional tariffs are introduced, uh, we think that's probably going to push us up somewhat uh, to the two and a quarter percent range. Um, fifth main point, uh, Federal Reserve policy. Uh, we've gotten two 25 basis point cuts in a row at the last two FOMC meetings. Uh, our expectation is one more cut at the October FOMC meeting. Um, that seems to be signaled by the Federal Reserve leadership, uh, and uh, we think it's, it's quite likely that they will cut again. Uh, but in our forecast, that's it. We don't have any additional uh, cuts uh, based on our forecast for the economy. Of course, if the uh, economy be behaves differently, they will cut uh, further. But in our view, uh, moderate growth and inflation at or a little bit above 2% uh, probably means no additional cuts. Uh, and then finally, as far as uh, the rest of the world is concerned, uh, we have a similar forecast directionally with growth stabilizing at um, trend or uh, maybe in some places slightly above trend rates. Uh, in China, uh, we have seen a significant slowdown in 2018. 2019 has been relatively stable as China has managed to offset the negative impact of the increased tariffs with easier domestic policy. Uh, we think they'll continue to manage to do that. Uh, as far as Europe's concerned, the, sh the slowdown has been sharper. Um, Germany is, uh, is contracting at the moment. Uh, the European economy is barely growing. Uh, we do think there will be some acceleration on the back of policy easing. Um, some, mon some additional monetary policy easing, some fiscal policy easing, and we also think that uh, one of the major risks overhanging uh, Europe, namely the departure of the United Kingdom from the, uh, from the European Union, is going to be resolved in a, in a market-friendly way. Our baseline is that Britain leaves with a deal uh, in the next few weeks by the end of uh, October, uh, and we think if that doesn't happen, if that turns out to be wrong, uh, the most likely, the next most likely outcome is that the uh, that uh, uh, Brexit ultimately doesn't happen, um, and the whole thing's reversed. We think a no deal Brexit is the least likely of the three major options. Uh, so that's the, the the basic outlook. Now, let me um, start out with just where we are in terms of the the growth environment. Clearly, there's been a significant slowdown. Uh, in global growth and in U.S. growth. Global growth has probably gone, if you look at it on a spot basis, uh, just the sequential growth pace. Uh, we've gone from somewhere around 4.5% in early 2018 to about 3% uh, at the moment. Um, I base that on what we see in the GDP numbers, global GDP numbers, and our current activity indicator, which is a higher frequency way of is estimating the current growth pace uh, of the economy that looks at uh, indicators like retail sales, purchasing managers' indices, employment numbers, jobless claims, so monthly and weekly numbers that uh, allow us to cross-check the message from uh, the GDP numbers. So a significant slowdown um, from a clearly above-trend pace to probably roughly a trend pace um, that uh, should keep the unemployment rate roughly stable if it's maintained here. We think 3% is uh, a reasonable estimate of that. And similarly, in the, in the US, a slowdown from the 3.5% range in early 2018 uh, to about 1.5% to 2%. Again, in our view, a, a trend pace. Uh, so that's, that's sort of where we, where we stand at the moment. Now, we think there is an, an argument for why growth might pick up modestly over the next uh, few quarters. Uh, and we think that argument revolves around uh, 
easier monetary policy and easier financial conditions. Uh, we spend a lot of time looking at our financial conditions index, which is um, a weighted average of interest rates, credit spreads, equity prices, and the dollar with weights that are uh, proportional to the impact of shocks to each of these markets on real GDP growth over the next year. So it's basically a way of summarizing uh, the financial environment uh, from the perspective of an economic forecaster who cares about growth. And our index showed a, um, a sharp tightening in financial conditions in 2018, especially in the fourth quarter of 2018. Um, and that's, that's weighed on growth. However, since the end of 2018, we've seen a substantial uh, easing in financial conditions. We've unwound about half of the tightening uh, that, uh, that occurred uh, the prior year. And it's changes in financial conditions that uh, matter for growth. So tightening means a negative impulse. Easing means uh, a positive impulse. And we can um, turn that statement into, into a statistical statement uh, just using uh, some simple uh, regression analysis. And uh, here's the, the result. This is our estimate of the impact of financial conditions on growth uh, at each point in time. So the most negative impact was uh, in, the, in the last few years was in, uh, in early 2019, um, basically corresponding to the sharp tightening in conditions that we had seen uh, the, the prior quarter and over, over the prior year. Uh, and since early 2019, generally the impact has become uh, somewhat less negative. And based on where markets are currently, that could change, of course, because financial markets uh, move, but based on where markets are currently, we would expect this impulse to become somewhat positive in early 2020. Um, now, this is a somewhat abstract way of looking at the impact of financial conditions on growth. Uh, a more straightforward impact is to focus on the impact of interest rates. And interest rates have their biggest impact on the real economy in the housing sector. The housing sector is by far the most interest rate sensitive sector of the, uh, of the US economy. And we can see in many of the more leading indicators of housing activity that uh, things are getting somewhat better. Um, so here are single family housing permits and the Home Builders Index, which is a survey of, uh, of home builders. Uh, both of those indicators de deteriorated in 2018 on the back of higher mortgage rates. But in the, in the course of 2019, uh, they've started to, to improve. And we should start to see that in the, uh, in, in, the, in the growth numbers, in the GDP numbers uh, as well. So financial conditions uh, suggest that uh, growth might pick up somewhat. Now, uh, the more negative uh, impact on the economy uh, and uh, one reason to think that maybe this somewhat uh, you know, some, somewhat positive expectation is subject to downside risk is obviously the, the trade side uh, and the impact of uh, trade restrictions on, on growth. Um, trade restrictions have continued to escalate. Trade tensions have continued to escalate over the last year and a half in fits and starts. Um, one, uh, one thing that has changed recently, which has made the uh, trade tensions somewhat more important uh, in our view for consumers and for the broader economy is that increasingly US tariffs on imports from China are hitting consumer goods. In the early days of the uh, trade restrictions, uh, the administration um, basically kept consumer goods mostly out of the, uh, out of the uh, goods that are, were being tariffed. Um, but as trade, uh, as tariffs have uh, gone to, uh, to, um, to affect all of the roughly $500 billion of US imports from China, um, that of course means that uh, you've also got to start hitting the consumer goods, and that's what we're seeing at the moment. There was a tariff introduction on September 1st that was more tilted towards consumer goods, and if we do get the uh, tariff uh, in uh, the middle of December that's currently 
scheduled, then that would be mostly consumer goods, including smartphones, computers, uh, and toys. So uh, that's, that's, that's important because uh, it will have more of an impact on inflation, uh, at least in the short term, and it will have an impact on, uh, therefore, the real purchasing power of US consumers. Um, and it's interesting that if you look at the relatively few categories of consumer goods that have seen tariffs already, uh, again, so far, uh, consumer goods have been mostly kept out of the, uh, the tariff goods universe. Um, but if you focus on those uh, consumer goods that have seen tariff introduction, we've actually seen a, a fairly meaningful increase in prices uh, at, for, those, for those goods. So that's uh, effectively saying that uh, when, um, the, uh, when companies have to pay the tariff, they do, um, put, they, they do add that to the, to the price and consumers do pay more. Um, so far, this hasn't been very important from an inflation perspective because the, uh, the amount of goods that have been affected by this has just been quite small. But as we uh, move into, uh, into broader categories of consumer goods, uh, we should start to see more of an inflationary impact. And depending on uh, just how widespread these um, uh, tariffs are going to be, uh, that is going to increasingly show up in uh, some of the inflation uh, indicators that, um, uh, that, that, that we look at. Uh, so our baseline would be that uh, maybe tariffs are going to add something like 0.3 percentage points to, to inflation. It doesn't sound like a huge number, and it's not a huge number, but it's the sort of number that starts to matter from the perspective of an, of an economic forecaster. Um, so that's the inflation side. What about the growth side? On the growth side, um, our estimate is that uh, the trade war is currently subtracting something like uh, a half percentage point from US growth. So if we're currently growing at 175, um, these estimates would say that without the trade war, uh, we'd be growing at about two and a quarter percent. Um, there are a number of contributors to that, um, and I should say that uh, these effects are relatively difficult to estimate, so you should think about uh, confidence intervals around all the, this. But, uh, but our analysis says that there are uh, basically four different contributors to the negative impulse, uh, the net negative impulse. Uh, one small positive impulse, which is that tariffs are making it somewhat easier for US consumers to gain market share, because you're effectively um, uh, hurting um, foreign, foreign competitors. Uh, that's the, um, uh, the net trade effect. And then there are three negative effects. Uh, a real income effect, which I already spoke about. Higher prices mean uh, less real income for US consumers, less ability to spend on other goods and services. Uh, then there is a, a negative uh, financial conditions effect. We see that in response to good news uh, on trade, relaxation of trade tensions, financial conditions ease. Uh, typically, the dollar weakens somewhat. Uh, equity prices go up. Um, credit spreads uh, tighten. Uh, whereas, uh, in response to bad news, financial conditions tighten. and. Uh, uh, because financial conditions play an important role in our view of the economy, as I talked about earlier, uh, that's a drag on growth. Uh, and then there's a final negative impact, which is uh, a sentiment and uncertainty effect, uh, which is probably the hardest to estimate. Um, and uh, I think the risk is that this is somewhat bigger. But the way we estimate it, uh, it subtracts maybe a tenth of a percentage point from, uh, from growth. Uh, this is basically. Uh, businesses becoming less willing to commit to long-term investment projects uh, and, uh, and that hitting, hitting growth. So this is, this is uh, our current, current estimate. Now, uh, if these estimates are right and if our assumptions about trade are right, then the, uh, the, the maximum negative impact on growth should be occurring right now. And as we go through 2020, the negative impact should become uh, less severe. That's, um, again, consistent with our expectation of maybe slightly better growth in, uh, in 2020, uh, obviously subject to risk. It's possible that uh, 
We do see continued escalation, but in our view, uh, it is probably in President Trump's interest in the run-up to the 2020 election uh, to at least dial back the escalation that we've been seeing over the last 18 months. Uh, and um, maybe in support of this, uh, it's, I think, interesting to note um, the president's approval ratings uh, on both overall and in, um, uh, with respect to the economy and trade policy. Um, his overall approval rating has been uh, about minus 10 percentage points if you look at uh, an, an, an average of approval minus disapproval. Approval is sort of averaged about 43 uh, percent. Disapproval is averaged about 53 percent. Um, but there are some very significant differences between different policy areas. Generally, his approval ratings have been quite strong on the economy. Um, and the economy has obviously uh, done quite well. Uh, however, his approval ratings on trade policy have been, uh, have been quite weak. Uh, and um, uh, about the same as his overall approval rating, if not a little bit weaker recently. And in particular, we've seen that in response to trade escalation, uh, generally, uh, the um, uh, trade approval rating has, uh, has gone down. So I think this underscores that it would probably be in the president's interest to uh, dial back the, uh, the escalation, focus on his strengths, which uh, uh, as far as approval is concerned, which is the economy, and move back from areas where uh, his approval is lower. Um, Third point I wanted to spend a little bit of time on, uh, just because it's getting uh, so much attention, uh, especially for monetary policymakers, is why is inflation so low? Um, we've, we've obviously got a very strong economy, but, uh, but inflation has been generally below the Fed's target. Why is it so low? I think the first thing to say is that it's actually not that low if you look at it relative to the last 20 years. It's obviously very low if you look at it relative to the 1970s or 1980s. But relative to the last 20 years, uh, we've been pretty stable in the neighborhood of, uh, of 2%. Depends a little bit on which indicator you look at, but uh, generally not too far away from 2% uh, in recent years, uh, though obviously lower in the immediate, immediate aftermath of the, uh, of the financial crisis. Um, now, to the extent that the recent numbers have been somewhat lower than you might expect in an environment with a 3.5% unemployment rate. Uh, I think the, the best structural explanation for uh, why the recent numbers have been lower uh, is actually not so much the Amazon effect or increased um, competitive pressures in the goods sector, which is, a, I think, a popular explanation. For, um, for, for, for lower inflation numbers. When we break down the difference between inflation in recent years and inflation at the peak of the last business cycle in the mid-2000s, right before uh, the crisis, um, good sector inflation is actually very, very similar to what it was back then. It's low now. It was low back then. It's really been low for, uh, uh, for, for at least a couple of decades. Uh, where inflation has been lower, um, and where I think it, it's, it makes more sense to talk about a structural uh, inflation weaknesses in the service sector, and in particular in the, in the healthcare sector. Healthcare service inflation has been substantially lower in recent years than it was uh, prior, to, uh, prior to the crisis and prior to the introduction of the Affordable Care Act, which, uh, at least in the way that uh, inflation is measured in the, uh, in the, in the personal consumption price index, uh, has significantly reduced healthcare cost inflation. Uh, and that's, uh, that's, uh, that explains effectively why we're um, uh, still somewhat below 2% uh, as opposed to above 2% um, 10, uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, if we look at the more sort of cyclical areas of uh, what, what drives inflation. Um, we are, um, I think there, there is uh, a good case for a gradual upward trend. Um, and by the cyclical areas, I mean uh, mainly the performance of the labor market and the tightness of the labor market. The unemployment rates fall into 3.5%. Uh, other indicators of labor market slack uh, 
um, and I'm listing um, a number of them here because I always like to cross-check the message of any individual indicator. Uh, other indicators are telling you a fairly similar story uh, that the labor market is tight and probably still getting somewhat tighter. Uh, that is gradually leading to faster wage growth. Uh, it's taken a long time. Wage growth was very weak at the, at the start of this expansion. Um, but we've gone from uh, about 1.5% at the, at the bottom uh, to about 3% or a little over 3% uh, recently. And that's probably roughly what one would expect in a fully employed labor market uh, that, um, uh, in an economy that generates about 1% productivity growth and where the central bank is uh, trying to achieve 2% inflation over time. That gives you about 3% for nominal wages. And that's, that's roughly where we, uh, where we are. So what, what are we expecting uh, on, on inflation? Uh, we're basically expecting uh, a gradual upward move uh, based on an economy that's still uh, creating a good number of jobs where the unemployment rate probably still has a little bit more downside, where wage growth is probably uh, still going to pick up somewhat. Uh, that's a gradual upward move. And overlaid on that, uh, we would expect some positive shorter-term effects from the tariffs. That's, that's not something that will boost inflation over the long term. It's really more an increase in the price level. So it's a little bit less um, relevant, perhaps, from a monetary policy perspective. But we think it will show up in the numbers uh, and give us, give us somewhat higher numbers by, uh, by early, uh, early, next, early next year. Now, uh, the fourth point um, I wanted to discuss, uh, and I touched on it earlier, is the question whether we are headed for a recession. Um, this is probably the biggest question that we get uh, in, um, from, from, from our clients. Uh, is the economy likely to go into a recession? There's a lot of concern about an impending recession. And I would say exhibit A of those who think that the economy is going to go into a recession is probably the slope of the yield curve, the difference between long-term interest rates and short-term interest rates. And not surprising that, uh, that people are worried about this, because historically, the slope of the yield curve has quite a good track record in predicting recession. Um, here is the difference between the 10-year Treasury yield and the one-year Treasury yield going back to the 1950s. Um, the Gray bars are all of the recessions in the, in the meantime. And as you can see, negative readings on uh, the slope of the yield curve have typically preceded a recession by something like six months to 18 months. Um, there are not really a lot of exceptions to this. The main one is one that occurred in the mid-1960s, which was obviously uh, quite, a long time, uh, quite a long time ago. Uh, so not, not surprising people are, are concerned about this. Um, what's my level of concern about this? I would say uh, that it's something to monitor for sure. But uh, I think it's, uh, it's likely that the slope of the yield curve is going to be uh, less predictive in the future uh, than it has been in the, in the past, uh, basically because of some structural changes in the, in the fixed income market, in the, in the bond market. Uh, historically, um, the, the yield curve was typically very steep in, under normal circumstances, uh, quite steep. You can see that the, the average of, uh, of this whole time series uh, used to be uh, plus 100, plus 200 uh, basis points. Um, uh, and the reason for this was that Historically, especially in the 1970s and 1980s, investors had to be compensated for owning long-term uh, bonds uh, rather than short-term bonds by a significant term premium. There was a lot of fear of inflation because of recent experience, uh, and that meant a large positive term premium that investors uh, had to um, uh, that investors required to uh, to own these bonds. Uh, and that meant that uh, for the yield curve to invert, uh, 
the market had to basically build in some very steep rate cuts into, uh, into its expectations to overcome the impact of that, uh, that large positive term premium, which basically meant that uh, yield curve inversions, uh, negative numbers here, were rare events that, were, that only occurred when markets had reason to believe that the Fed would have to be very aggressive in cutting. So that was a very big statement about what the pro economy had to deliver to get these um, uh, to get these cuts, and that meant uh, uh, and, and typically when when those expectations were quite extreme, uh, the market was correct in anticipating a, uh, a bad economic environment, and typically was followed by a recession. Uh, now, the term premium uh, looks quite different. Uh, here, I'm showing the difference between the estimated term premium on 10-year yields minus one-year yields. Um, and uh, term premium now is basically zero or negative, at least as best we can tell. Um, investors no longer have to be compensated for holding long-term paper, um, basically because the I think there are a number of reasons, but the most important one is that the fear of inflation is gone. People aren't really worried that inflation is going to rise significantly in the, in the future. Um, so the yield curve is structurally a lot flatter. And that also means that yield curve inversions are uh, less meaningful events, probably will occur more frequently, but probably won't be as predictive for, for recession as in, the, as in the past. Again, I would not ignore the message from the, from the yield curve. It is uh, an important market measure. And uh, there are a lot of smart people in the bond market who think about where different uh, interest rates should be priced. Um, so it's, it's not something to throw out. But I do think you have to put it in perspective somewhat. So if, if this is not a, um, a very good way of thinking about the, uh, the prospects for recession, what is a good way uh, to think about the prospects for recession? What we have done um, in, a, um, in a study that we published earlier this year uh, is to look at history, um, to look at the long-term uh, long-term track record or the, the, the long-term history of recessions in the United States. And we went back a century uh, and used historical records and, uh, and, and, and published data to basically classify the different recessions since then, all the recessions since then, uh, into different categories uh, as far as drivers are concerned. And we, we came up with five categories uh, of, uh, uh, of drivers um, that, are, that are listed here. Number one, industrial cycles uh, that um, uh, big ups and downs in the manufacturing sector of the economy. Uh, number two, oil shocks. Uh, number three, uh, monetary policy tightening on the back of big increases in inflation. Uh, number four, Financial imbalances, asset price bubbles, over leverage in the, in the private sector. Uh, and then number five, fiscal retrenchments, uh, which were typically the demobilizations after major wars. Um, and as you can see, there are basically three, um, three drivers that have been most prominent in recent decades, uh, namely oil shocks. Uh, monetary and financial. Um, and we think there is a good case uh, to be made that all three of these are less likely to push us into a recession in the, in the near term uh, than, uh, than perhaps they, they have been at comparable points in the past. Oil shocks, we think, are uh, le probably less relevant because oil is a less important part of the global economy, um, the share of oil uh, oil expenditure as, uh, it, as, a, as a share of GDP is significantly lower uh, than it was in the past. And especially in the United States, oil price shocks have less of an impact on growth because of the rise of shale and the fact that the US is much closer to self-sufficiency uh, on oil. Um, large inflationary overheating um, and aggressive monetary tightening also doesn't seem particularly likely. We're talking about inflation being too low rather than too high. 
So a lot would have to change to turn that into uh, a, a situation where we would be concerned uh, about, uh, about overheating and excessive uh, over-tightening of monetary policy. That leaves uh, the final one, which actually has been uh, the most important recession driver of the last few decades, namely financial asset bubbles uh, and uh, over leverage in the, in the private sector. Uh, we think this was really the key driver of the last two recessions, both the great financial crisis uh, of 2008 and the milder recession of 2001. Both were driven by bursting asset bubbles uh, in the equity market and the housing market, respectively. Uh, and we think that financial uh, imbalances also had a role to play, though probably a, a smaller one, in the 1990-91 recession. Uh, so what's the, uh, the probability of a um, financial asset price-driven recession uh, in this case? Uh, we are more optimistic that uh, we can avoid um, this type of recession uh, I think, than many. And here's a chart that kind of lies behind that relative optimism. Um, and I need to explain this a little bit. This is uh, the so-called private sector financial balance, which is the difference between the total income and total spending of all households and businesses. Um, so income is wage income, dividend income, uh, social security income. Uh, as well as corporate cash flow. I just add all of this up. I subtract uh, all of the private expenditure components of the national accounts, so personal consumption, home building, uh, business investment, et cetera. And the difference gives me um, the private sector financial balance. Uh, typically, it's positive, which means that typically, Households and firms spend less than they earn and build up their financial assets uh, with, the, with the difference. Um, however, sometimes the private sector balance goes negative uh, and households and firms run a financial deficit and actually spend more than they earn and then have to finance that gap with net debt accumulation. So in order to just maintain the current level of spending, they've got to increase uh, their net indebtedness uh, at a, um, in some cases, a, a rapid pace. Uh, and that's a, that, that often happens in periods of significant asset price booms, when equity prices are going up sharply, households feel richer, they borrow against the uh, increased, or, or businesses borrow against the increased value of, uh, of, of, of their equity uh, and can maintain a higher spending level than their current income. That's what happened in the, in the, in the late 1990s. And uh, when house prices are going up rapidly, uh, people cash out refinance, they take out home equity loans, uh, and they, um, they therefore uh, also spend more than their income. That's what happened in the, in the mid-2000s. That's a dangerous place to be, because in that case, um, the level of spending is uh, basically dependent on continued asset price gains. And when those asset price gains come to an end, let alone when they reverse, spending has to uh, come down. Uh, often that's also a time when availability of credit deteriorates, banks become less willing to make loans in a, in a worse asset price environment, and that um, can then deliver a significant negative shock to um, overall demand and therefore to output and, uh, and employment uh, and can trigger a recession. I think that's what happened uh, in the US in, the, in those two instances. You could look at this in, in other countries as well. It's quite a predictive uh, variable for recessions. Um, and the good news is that despite the fact that we've seen significant asset price increases in a number of areas, stock prices have obviously gone up a lot, um, credit markets have done quite well, commercial real estate markets have done quite well, we're not really seeing um, anything like the sort of private sector deficits that um, that caused uh, so many problems in these, in these prior episodes. Uh, in fact, the private sector is running a financial surplus of more than 4% of GDP, which is um, roughly the long-term historical average and well above the historical average for a, a, a business expansion uh, that has progressed as far as this one has. Um, so uh, I think that's 
reassuring. What's also reassuring is that it seems this uh, surplus is relatively well um, distributed between households and businesses. So it's not the case that only the household sector has a, uh, has a uh, high quality balance sheet, um, but uh, the, the business sector, even though there's been more debt growth in the, in the business sector, business sector is not running a large financial deficit either. Um, unlike, for example, uh, prior to the financial crisis, or even more so, prior to the tech bust of the, of the early 2000s. Um, so what that says to me uh, is that um, the, there are certainly some recession risks. There are a number of policy uncertainties uh, specifically related to, uh, to trade. Uh, further escalation uh, would probably raise those, uh, those recession risks. But um, at the same time, the private sector is quite uh, quite resilient, and at least as far as recession is concerned, our expectation would, would be that, uh, that that resilience ends up winning uh, the tug of war that I started out with. Let me leave it there, and um, I think we're going to go to questions at this point, um, and I think it's a combination of live and online questions. Thank you very much for your remarks. For those on our... For our live stream viewers, please remember to ask your questions at ccga.live. And for our in-room audience, please raise your hand if you have a question. I'll acknowledge you, and a member of our staff will bring a microphone to you. Yes, right here in the fifth row, please. Hi, Aaron Chandra, JP Morgan. Thanks for being here. Um, my question is um, about the repo markets, and I'm curious, given your involvement with the New York Fed, so over the last couple of weeks, they've infused something like a hundred plus billion dollars into the repo market, with plans for another two to four hundred billion dollars in the near future. Um, do you see this as a kind of QE five, and in general, do you see it as a good, bad, or, or neutral development? I would. I don't view it as QE five uh, or QE four. Uh, I view it. It is a balance sheet expansion. In that sense, it's, uh, it's similar to the, um, to the various QE programs. And we think that we will see some permanent open market operations, uh, additional, per not just temporary open market operations, which is what, what we've seen so far, but permanent open market operations that result in uh, balance sheet growth purchases of uh, treasuries over uh, over the next several months. That's been more or less pre-announced by Chair Powell in a speech this uh, this week. Um, however, those unlike the uh, QE one, two, and three, uh, where the focus was really on buying longer-term treasuries in order to depress the term premium and thereby boost uh, the value of asset prices broad, more broadly through the economy. Uh, these purchases are going to be much more focused on treasury bills and very short-dated coupon securities. Um, so the, the idea here is to make sure that bank, bank reserves are at a sufficient level for monetary policy to be transmitted properly uh, rather than to, to boost asset prices. So while some of the mechanics are similar, uh, the goal is very different. And, um, and so I wouldn't, wouldn't uh, uh, regard this as QE. Is it good, bad, or indifferent? Uh, I think the goal is for it to be indifferent. Um, the goal is to make sure that uh, uh, short-term interest rates are in line with the FOMC's uh, interest, rate, uh, interest rate goals um, and are not above the, the top end of the, of the target range, not above 2%. Um, and I, I think the Fed has the ability and the firepower to ensure that, but it, uh, they, they're having to provide a lot more reserves than they thought was going to be necessary a few months ago. But once they do that, then I think we're back in indifferent territory. Um, yes, in the side of the uh, blue and white shirt, please. Would you say that the 
potential of a trade war with China and no deal Brexit would increase the chances of a another great recession. Thank you. Well, I think the if the trade war were to escalate much further than what we're what we're forecasting, I think that would increase the risk of of a recession, um, a great recession. I think that's a uh, that's a more more extreme case. Um, I think if there uh, if there were a recession, my expectation would be that it wouldn't be as deep as the uh, recession of 2007 to 2009, mainly because of the relative absence of imbalances in the in the private sector. Um, but uh, I do think it, it would be a risk. Uh, as far as Brexit is concerned, Brexit is probably not that important for the United States. It's extremely important for the United Kingdom. It's moderately important for uh, the European Union. Um, but when we try to estimate the impact of different Brexit scenarios for, for the US, typically we get very small numbers uh, just because the integration between uh, between the U.S. and the and the U U.K. is just not that great. It's much greater for countries like, you know, obviously Ireland to some degree, Germany uh, to a lesser degree, other other European countries. Um, so that's that that's definitely lower down on the list of uh, of concerns from a U.S. perspective. Yes, sir. In the front row, please. And a microphone's on its way. Thank you. Uh, one factor you haven't mentioned is the federal deficit as percentage of GMP. What kind of impact do you think the continuing growing deficit will have? Well, the deficit is large. Um, we're close to 5% of, uh, of GDP at the, at the moment. That's, uh, that's not, a, it's not a huge number in a, in a recession or in a period of weak labor markets, but it's definitely large. Uh, with an unemployment rate of 3.5%. I think the implication is uh, twofold, um, and, the, and the cost of this, I think, is twofold. One, uh, over the longer term, we probably do need to reduce the deficit uh, in an environment in which demographic pressures and uh, Social Security and Medicare spending are going to be pushing towards an increase in the, in the deficit, so that uh, uh, is going to mean either raising taxes or, or cutting spending in other areas. Those are really the only uh, two ways to, to address it. Uh, and then I would say in the shorter term, um, if and when there is a recession at some point in the, in the future, uh, with an, a deficit that's already large, that reduces the uh, federal government's ability to respond to a recession by easy, by cutting taxes or, or increasing spending, uh, and that probably means there's less policy flexibility than there would have been in, uh, in past cycles. The tax cuts of 2001 under President Bush uh, and the stimulus of 2009, in our view, uh, were uh, important reasons um, for why these recessions were not even worse than they, than they already were. And that's going to be more difficult. Um, I would say um, on the maybe uh, somewhat less concerned side, I'm, I, I think the, the likelihood that we're going to see a fiscal crisis uh, because of an excessive deficit, I think is quite low. The, um, uh, the fiscal crises typically are things that we see in emerging economies uh, with, um, you know, with, uh, with central banks that uh, you know, maybe in some cases pursue a fixed exchange rate, uh, the Asian fiscal crisis uh, uh, of, the, of the late 1990s are a case in point. In an advanced economy, and especially in the United States, uh, with the uh, US dollar being the world's reserve currency, it's very difficult to see an environment where there was, would be anything crisis-like. So um, as, I, as I talked about at, at some length, I, I am quite concerned when I see private sector deficits, because when the private sector runs a large deficit, uh, that, I think, raises the, the risk that uh, the private sector might lose access to credit in a, in a downturn and, and have to 
cut back spending sharply and thereby deliver a large negative shock to, to demand, the same kind of thing just doesn't happen with the, with the federal government because the US Treasury never loses access to credit. Um, yes, sir, in the third row, please. And a um, microphone's on it. Thank you. How does rising income inequality impact current and future inflation estimates and FOMC monetary policy? I think um, rising income inequality has uh, some, Im I think, some effects on the shorter term ups and downs of the, of the cycle. Um, but I think most of the, the relevance of rising income inequality are really more longer term issues. Uh, uh, the economy doesn't operate dramatically differently in a, in a higher inequality versus lower inequality environment. There are some some things that require some, uh, some interpretation. Saving rates, for example, uh, if you have a rising income inequality, uh, given that uh, higher income families tend to save a larger share of their income, that should be a, a reason to observe a, a higher saving rate. So the fact that the saving rate right now is relatively high compared with the, uh, the norm of the last 20 or 30 years probably has something to do with uh, uh, with, with rising income inequality, but I don't think it has a major impact on the inflation numbers. Uh, and ultimately, monetary policy is going to be made uh, with, um, you know, with respect to effectively the averages as opposed to different, different income groups. Now, one thing that uh, I think the Fed is very focused on is uh, the, the fact that labor market recovery and labor market expansion um, is particularly important for lower income groups. Uh, unemployment rates and wage growth are much more sensitive to, um, uh, or, or, or rather, wage growth and income growth at the, at the bottom of the income distribution is much more sensitive to the, to the strength of the labor market. So that's a very strong argument, I think, from the, uh, the Fed's perspective to keep this labor market recovery going, uh, because finally it is actually resulting in some uh, more significant real income gains in the, in the bottom half of the, of the income distribution. Um, and right now, over the last couple of years, uh, income's actually grown somewhat faster at the bottom than, uh, than at the top. Over the last couple of years, over the last 40 years as a whole, that's not at all the case. But over the last couple of years, from a cyclical perspective, we are seeing some uh, more significant income gains uh, at the bottom or in the bottom half of the distribution, which sort of resembles a little bit what we saw in the labor market boom of the late 1990s, where uh, also generally we saw uh, more strength at the, at the bottom. Uh, yes, sir, in the second to last row. If a progressive Democrat wins the White House, what sort of impact do you think that would have on the economy? Well, I think a lot would depend on, the, uh, on what happens in, in Congress. Uh, if you had a progressive Democrat win, uh, but the Senate still stayed uh, under Republican control, then I think on the legislative side, uh, probably not, uh, not that much. Um, I think, it w you know, for the most part, you'd still be looking at gridlock, uh, where the, uh, the president would make a significant difference would be in appointments, um, Federal Reserve appointments, um, regulatory uh, uh, appointments, competition policy, uh, financial regulation, and uh, if there is a democratic uh, uh, president, we would expect uh, that to have an impact on you know, tighter financial regulation, uh, probably more uh, uh, tighter regulation of, uh, of mergers, uh, and um, you know, probably uh, somewhat different appointments to the Federal Reserve, although this one is, uh, is a little bit hard to kind of place in a, in a spectrum. Uh, whether it would result in more hawkish or more dovish Fed appointments is actually somewhat unclear, uh, given uh, the president's recent uh, criticism of the of the Fed from a from a dovish perspective. Um, so, 
you know, I think if you, if you had a democratic sweep with a democratic president and two democratic houses of, of Congress, then I'd say probably the tax system would become more progressive. Upper income taxes would, uh, would probably go up. Um, at least income taxes, uh, possibly there would be a wealth tax, although I think the hurdles there would probably be somewhat higher. Uh, and we probably also uh, would see at least a significant push for uh, further changes to healthcare legislation, maybe with the introduction of a, of a public option for the Afford Affordable Care Act, maybe even with a push for Medicare for all, although again, that's uh, I think a somewhat higher hurdle and you'd probably uh, need to see uh, a large Democratic majority in the, in the Senate, which is probably not a uh, realistic expectation for 2020. Probably would uh, take a little bit longer, uh, even in a scenario where that ultimately did happen. Uh, yes, sir, in the front row, please. Thanks very much. I wonder if I could invite you to talk about two things that are embedded in your talk, but that you didn't address uh, overtly. Um, Business spending, CapEx, and uh, productivity. In the post-crisis period, we've been sort of lagging in business uh, expenditures, and uh, it has begged the question about productivity growth and its importance to the inflation equation. Sure. So as far as business investments concerned, um, you're right, it's been, uh, it's been somewhat sluggish in 2019 in particular. 2018 was somewhat stronger uh, on the back of the uh, corporate tax reform, but it didn't last very long. Uh, this year, uh, business spending has gone kind of broadly sideways uh, at a time when personal consumption has actually been growing at a, at a pretty good pace. Um, so on net, business spending has been a, been a drag on growth. And we wouldn't expect that to, to change much, partly because of some of the uncertainties around the, the policy environment uh, from the trade side. Uh, and other areas. The run-up to the presidential election might also mean additional uncertainty. Um, so, uh, you know, our, our expectation would be uh, broadly more of the same as far as business investments concerned. Uh, as far as productivity is, uh, is concerned, um, you're right, productivity growth has been significantly lower in the post-crisis period uh, than before, roughly 1% after the crisis versus 2% uh, plus before the crisis. There are probably a number of different reasons for that. Uh, one reason, I think, is that it took quite a long time uh, for uh, productivity um, and for investment and productivity to kind of shake off the after effects of the, of the crisis. There was some rebound in, in business investment, but it took a long time to, to occur. Uh, I also think, in addition, um, the mismeasurement of productivity growth has probably increased over time. The economy is becoming more difficult to measure for the statisticians. Uh, it's, uh, the, uh, in particular, real output uh, is becoming more difficult to measure um, because goods and services are changing in quality, improving in quality in many cases, in ways that are difficult to capture for the statisticians, and important parts of the economy are basically not really included in GDP. Anything that's free um, or maybe paid for by advertising uh, is not included in GDP. So Google's uh, search service, for example, basically doesn't show up in, uh, in GDP because it's given away for free uh, in return for you looking at, uh, at ads. Um, and uh, that's, that's an increasingly important uh, part of the economy that uh, that we're, we're basically missing, and that's ha that's having a direct one one for one impact on the productivity numbers as well. So, I think the reality uh, of productivity growth probably hasn't deteriorated quite as much as the uh, as the measured numbers, uh, but it's nevertheless been relatively sluggish. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Please join me in thanking Jan Hatzius. Thank you.